walking by my door. Is it a, a little warmer? But uh, the sound, the sound is much better. I'm just going to do some levels right here. Yeah, you don't have any wind blowing in your screens here. Yeah. All right. <laughs> wow. Have you ever heard that famous song, "On the Way to Cape May"? Absolutely. Can you? On the way to Cape May, I don't know the rest of the words. <laughs> <laughs> For real? Really? You're like Mr. Jersey I know, Cape. but you know, this isn't Cape May. This is Wildwood. Oh. oh. Pe people are going to start figuring it out. Um, we sound pretty good with microphones and masks on. Yeah. This is my first f interview with masks on. Really? That's yeah. that's interesting. You well, think we're we think we're good at least six feet apart? Well, we're six feet, but I mean, I have an N95. How about you? I don't have like the robot thing you have on your head. Yeah, but it looks pretty strong. All right, you worried about me? I'll go. No, throw I'm not on worried some about you. Okay. I'm uh, vaxxed and boosted, and I'm probably going to get my second booster in a month or two. You, uh, from what I know, mm -hmm. have been very, you know, concerned about the pandemic. You wear these incredible masks. You're a very kind of social guy, but you haven't been vaxxed. I have not. I have been in the middle of uh, all the germs for the last two years, uh, dealing with hundreds of people who do not wear masks on the boardwalk as a general rule. Right. Particularly the first year was really bad with the mandate where people were very contrary and not going to wear a mask just because they were being told to wear a mask. I had one guy spit on me because I told him, I'm sorry, you have to have a mask. And I was very nice and explained to him what we were mandated. Right. And he tried to explain to me how the masks don't do anything. And he doesn't believe in the COVID and it doesn't exist. And I said to him, I says, look, you know, I'm not here to argue with your opinion. I says, I don't think they're telling us the truth on everything. I says, but we are erring on the side of caution. And we are mandated at this time that everybody had to have a mask with inside the building. I said, so I have to have everybody wear a mask if they're going to come in. And he's going to go on and on and on. And next thing you know, he spits in my face. Oh, jeez. So this is, unfortunately, the dark side of dealing with the general public. It's not always tinsel and glamour, yeah. uh, but it's real. And you yeah. deal with it. And I was quite upset about it because I don't know what was going to happen. He could have been sick in, in, in two weeks, then yeah. I have it. Exactly. And as a matter of fact... <laughs> Um, it could have gotten quite ugly, but I noticed a police officer just passing by my arcade at the time. And, uh, you know, after he spit in my face and I'm getting really hot, I see the cop and I go, Officer! And uh, I caught his attention. And I stop out to about 24, 20 feet to get the officer. And the guy sees what's going to happen. And he slithers out into the crowd on the boardwalk to get lost. And I told the cop and, you know, pointed where he went. And the cop went down and got him at the corner. So I'm standing at my arcade waiting for him to come back and get my information as they always do they ask for your id and all that stuff and nobody comes back i'm standing there half an hour and nobody comes back next yeah. thing you know i'm saying to myself oh my god i you know where do i stand on this i mean i don't know any information about this guy so i called the police station i said you know your officer was here you know did, i hope he got this guy's information and uh they had to call me back and tell me that uh, all the officer did was you know speak with the guy he didn't get his id or anything else like that so i was really really concerned but it was a very powder keg time where if you said anything to anybody about a mask they were ready to jump down your throat right um today it's still tension oh yeah but not as it was it's in the beginning it's gonna get bad again because everyone considers uh, well the, the this this edge. whole mask thing the whole covid right. thing we'll get to it later good yeah. afternoon kate and may we're live from wildwood this time this is WCFA 101.5 FM, Cape May Radio, streaming on capemayradio.org. Tweet us live at Cape May Radio and email us at david at capemayradio.org. It's the Will King and Family Transmission, presented by St. Babs. Become a member of Cape May Radio and support our kinds of shows you can't find anywhere else or become an underwriter, and our station will promote your business or program by emailing david at capemayradio.org. But first, we got to thank the Wawa Foundation and the National Philanthropic Trust, Schwab Charitable Foundation, Michelle Fon, and of course, a very special thank you to the Center for Community Arts. 
and the WCFA Cape May Radio Station Management Group. But wait, there's more, and generously, the Will Keenan Family Transmission, presented by St. Babs. Funding has been made possible in part by the New Jersey State Council on the Arts, the Department of State, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Cape May County Board of Chosen Freeholders through the Cape May County Department of Tourism, Public Information, and Culture and Heritage. Here we are. So I just walked into this place, and uh, wow. So it's an old, War I just walked into an old Woolworths on Pacific Avenue in Wildwood, and immediately you walk in the door, and there's just stuff, 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 stuff everywhere, and it's all from, like, uh, you know, amusement parks and, and boardwalk arcade games. This is amazing, and it's called, no, we're, we're not going to say it, because our first guest, we're going to get... <laughs> We're going to get right into it. Our first guest is a television personality, amusement business owner and operator, the world's foremost collector of amusement devices and memorabilia. Is that true? Like yeah, absolutely. Okay. Really? Yes. I'm in the presence of a world's foremost someone? You are in the presence of greatness. <laughs> and author. Where, where, can we get your book somewhere? Uh, absolutely. They're available online. Amazon carries them in Barnes what's and it, Noble. What's it called? And, well, I have three books. My first one was called uh, Boardwalk, My Life and Jersey Shore. And that's all about the memories of the places that were in my time growing up on the boardwalk and the things and the events that went on. My second book is called Fascination, The Lifetime Boardwalk Adventure. And that's about the fascination game. Because you're like game. Mr. Fascination. Well, I am. I've devoted my life to this game. It's a very special game. It's far more than just an arcade game. It is an interaction game with people where you're playing not against the machine. The machine is playing as a tool, as an extension of you. Okay, okay, okay. What's people. the second book? Uh, that is the second book. Okay, the third, third book. book is called So You Want to Be on Reality TV. Oh, because, oh. okay, well, no, that's perfect <laughs> because your credits include a primary featured personality appearing in all of the following. A&E Network, Lifetime Channel, and Lifetime Movie Network. Hoarders and Hoarders, where are they now? CBS, NBC, ABC, Fox, Inside Edition, ABC The View, NBC, WMGM presents Picky. What is that? Pinky Kravitz. You don't remember Pinky? Oh, wait a minute. Oh, he was the big uh, radio and uh, TV personality yeah, yeah, yeah. from Atlantic County. Atlantic WMGM. City. WMGM TV. That was NBC okay. 40. So it was affiliate. a local affiliate. Yeah, it yeah. was a local affiliate. Right. And uh, he was a regional guy. I and very, remember. very well known. Very but now nice I'm aging guy. myself. I'm going to keep going. USA Today. GQ Magazine. Playboy Magazine. Did you, uh, did they you actually were you the do, centerfold? Well, I could have been, but they actually have articles. They do. They pride themselves on their writing and their stories. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's I, amazing. I, you know, it's the biggest, you know, kind of uh, laugh in the world, but they've always had great journalism. They really have. So even when I was younger and someone's all Playboy or something around, I'd be well, like, getting it for the articles. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Uh, let's keep it. American Heritage Magazine, Fun Time Magazine, Game Room Magazine, Front Page Cover Story, and all of the following Philadelphia Daily News, Perrier Post, Press of Atlantic City, Asbury Park Press, Gazette Leader, The Herald, and more. On air featured personality appearing on Action News, Eyewitness News, NBC, WMGM News, plus numerous radio shows like this one yes. on Cape May Radio, and the subject and star of featured your length documentaries more than one well you know when you're mr they're called mr fascination <laughs> and the wonderful world of randy uh those are the two documentaries well you know let me tell you something when you have a personality such as i and you've devoted your life to what you do yeah. you become a unique icon because people they they all have one thing in common they have dreams and many people don't get to live their dream. It's, it's an unusual thing. They all have dreams, which keeps us going in life. It's important to have. But how many people really get to live their dreams? I'm that rare commodity that yeah. has. And is and that why? Is that why? Because here's, here's the, uh, the one quote, except for, I'm sure, all the great quotes you're going to give us today. Is that why you say it is not for money alone that a man spends his life building a business? It is to pres preserve a way of life that one knew and loved. And you, you say, I must remain loyal to the old ways. And, and die, die out, out with them if needs must. 
Okay. That's actually a You're quote. That fatal- that's, a, that's a quote from Dickens. And uh, I relate you to it You get credit much. for it on well, the Well, I get credit because I <laughs> adapted it. But uh, <laughs> uh, that is an, a very profound statement because y- if you spend your entire life doing what you love, you never work a day in your life. Yeah. Now, I put in tremendous hours, more hours than anybody would ever consider doing or even right. figure it was possible but, but to do. But you do it for a dollar an hour if someone pays Well, you. I don't even get paid. Uh, I, my parents helped me also all the years. I yeah. mean, I've lost them both now. It's 10 years. But they never got paid for helping me all the years in the business. And they used to put money into it of their own personal money. Yeah. Well, but what, it, what did they do, by the way? Well, I, as their profession before we got into the business, yeah. my dad was an attorney and my mom was a, a former teacher, Good. Um, but Good my, combo. well, my dad was an attorney back when attorneys were honorable, shall we say? Not to you know get all the hate mail from all the attorneys right now, but it's the same thing as when doctors made house calls. Doctors don't make house calls anymore because it's not as noble a profession. It's more of a job and money, and people went into it for the money. Right. But when doctors made house calls, attorneys really believed in justice, and. That's the kind of lawyer my my father was. He yeah. used to go to represent people for night court, and he would get twenty dollars. Right. And I remember saying to my Around father, here? "Is this where you Well, grew up? no, we were from North Jersey. I mean, okay. his practice was in Newark. Back when Newark was okay. a very, very you know great city, it has become again a good city, but it was in a big decline. You know, during yeah. the end of his career. But uh, I remember, you know, we lived in Short Hills, which is a suburb, you know, in Essex County. And I remember him going to Jersey City in night court, taking the mass transit and the train and didn't get home until 11 o'clock at night because he had night court. And my mom was all upset, like, why are you getting back so late? And he said he had night court. And, uh, you know, how much did he make for doing that? $20. So, So when did he finally start making money to fund your business? Well, I think he made money in his youth. In the business, uh, yeah. you know, not every case is a charity case. And, sure, you know, sure. he did things from parking tickets to murders. Yeah. Um, but you have to understand when you work yourself and you don't have a big payroll and you have the aptitude to work on the machines, you don't have to hire technicians, it's not really costly to be in a business yourself. The costs are in the expenses when you have everybody else doing the work for you. So the, the setup costs are there, of course, but when we started, we started very small in a very old park. So the cost of setting up was extremely low. This was Keensburg Amusement Park. I don't know if anybody from down here is aware of it, but there, um, before there was a parkway, the Jersey Shore started with Sandy Hook and, and went on down. Esbury Park was going down pretty far. And people all lived in Bayonne and Jersey City and Newark and all those areas were the suburbs of New York and the cities. So people went to the shore, they went over the Raritan River, and there you were. So Keensburg Amusement Park was quite the park in its heyday of the 1920s, the 30s, into the 40s. But when they built the parkway in the 50s, people started migrating further south. People started buying land and moving further south as populations grew out of those urban areas that were at one time very populated. And uh, Keensburg became a shadow of what it was. Mm. They used to have ferry boats going across the Raritan Bay to New York, bringing boatloads of people. Are you saying he bought a a bunch of real estate and that's why you're rich? No, not at all. Um, We started um, leasing a property at the amusement park. They called it an amusement park, but it was set up like a boardwalk. But they there were two people at that time who owned everything, so they ran it like a park, unlike you have on the boardwalk here in Wildwood and most boardwalks you have properties owned by different landlords there. Yeah. It was Speaking all owned by the park. You a guy like you coming from North Jersey, doing what, you know, the Maury's have done in Wildwood for so long. <clears throat> were you like in uh was it hard to not be considered a shooby? Which is, by the way, what's the well, definition of shuby for our international listeners? Well, I don't know what their definition is here other than coming down with a shoebox lunch, which is why they called it a shuby yeah. coming here to when I grew up on though, vacation. When I kind of the 80s, uh, people told me it meant shuby, should be living down the shore. No. Well, I thought it was more like shoe get out of here because they weren't exactly welcomed uh, a lot of times by the locals. Um, I was not welcomed. 
when I came down to Wildwood. I was an invader into this right. town, and I was treated as such, and I was told I was an invader by a friend of mine who I knew for a lot of years in the business. And when he found out I was you know, coming down here to operate my business, he called me on the phone at home, and he told me I'm a piece of shit, and I'm an invader in, in his town, and he's going to pound on my head as much as possible and put me out of business as quickly wow. as possible because he has to make a statement to the industry. Oh my God! And I the, said, "What the, kind the industry? Not the local well, industry." Well, meaning the amusement industry, which huh. he was known in. Right. And I was like, "What kind of statement do you have to make to the industry that you're nuts?" Yeah. I says, "That that's <laughs> ridiculous." He said, "Well, so nobody else gets the bright idea to come down here and be in competition uh, competition with what I do here." Right. And I, I, you know, you just can't reason with some people. I wasn't coming down to be in competition yeah. to anybody. I was coming down to operate yeah. my business. But this many years later, uh, do you feel like you've been accepted a little more? Well, I've certainly been accepted more because I'm here in Wildwood now 25 years. Yeah. But well, that, that, I, Oh, I'm sorry. That's but, what I meant when you came down here. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, okay. Um, but I will never be 100% accepted here no, because okay. I didn't grow up in but Wildwood. But now you have fans and stuff. They can't ignore you. I do, but most of my fans are not locals to Wildwood. Most okay. of my fans are the people who love to come to Wildwood. Right. And there's a lot of people who really love Yeah, there's to come a difference between the people who come here when it, uh, during the season and the ones who are here year-round. Well, there's definitely a difference, and there's a crossover between did you, did different you ever, cultures. Did um, you know, donate to political campaigns, though? That may have helped. Um, <laughs> no, I, I don't believe in that, because to me, that's a payoff. And as a matter of fact, this man who told me I was an invader in his town was trying to get me to go elsewhere. Yeah. And one of the places he suggested I go was Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, which I know very little about and knew nothing about at the time. And uh, I said to him, I said, I don't even know if our our type of game is licensable yeah. in Rehoboth Beach. And he told me, well, all I have to do is go see the powers yeah. that be, explain to them what I want to do, and uh, write them a blank check for their re-election campaign. Right. And I, I was shocked at that. I said, yeah. have you ever done that before? He says, yeah, that works. He says, you just write them a blank check, and then they can fill it in however they want, and you know, to whoever they want, and it's a payoff. Well, I would never dream of insulting somebody with a bribe. That's what that yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. It's, so well, it's a I mean, legal, supposedly ethical bribe. Now, you've been kind of battling the Wildwood Council, right, for 10 years or more? Well, uh, because I was very unwelcomed, it all boils down to the initial thing that I just explained to you about right. the one particular guy who didn't want me here. And he had very personal reasons for it right. because I was basically in the same type of business directly as he was, which not everybody else was. And he knew that I was extremely good at what I did. So um, he didn't want me here because he saw me as a threat. But Wildwood's a big resort area. You know, prior to this, I was in Seaside Heights and I was doing the same thing there. But Seaside was mainly six blocks of boardwalk. You had some extension boardwalk in the north and the south, but the main boardwalk was six blocks. Wildwood is what, 22 blocks? It, you know, it's, it's pretty big, and there's many operations here and many more people who came here, particularly back, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, you couldn't move in this town. So um, I have to believe that he had influence being here for 40 years himself yeah. before I got here. People knew him, and he had a lot of places on the boardwalk, and it was not unbeknownst to anybody that he was unhappy about me being here. Mm -hmm. So it's not a far stone's throw to say that he had some influence in the powers that be to not make me welcome. Right. Is, that, so, is that why it took so long for you to potentially get approval to open where we are now? Which, well, it's, it's an old Wool Woolworths. It's completely, completely packed with all the stuff Randy's collected through the years. Amusement, uh, what would you call it? Well, it's it's a collection of New Jersey State it's, amusements, and it's also huge. And you wanted to open this place up, yeah, as absolutely. A museum, right? Well, this isn't the first time I've done an amusement museum. Uh, this is not my first attempt at it. My first right. attempt was the first place that I leased when I came down, where I was told I was an invader, right. and I was up at Three Thousand Boardwalk, which is between Glenwood and um, Maple Avenue right. at that time. And uh, by I the way, do you know there's an actual Randy Land in Pittsburgh? Um, I I heard that this some artist uh, has coined. Yeah my name for it and yeah. done a lot of graffiti work and art Neither outside. Neither of you got whatever. the trademark or the copyright? Well, I didn't copyright it.
hide anything. You know, it's 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 a name thing. It's kind of like McDonald's. Mr. McDonald didn't, you know, in the beginning. And, and so did did Randy Land? And I'm looking at all the because uh, I've read the GQ article, a bunch of articles, and the, everyone likes to talk about the mannequins that are in your likeness. Well, <laughs> did you did you <coughs> come up with that kind of branding? Well, when by you talk about Disney, actually, yes, uh, that I is the, that is the connection. Uh, it, it started as a joke one time. I was Main Street Operations for the Magic Kingdom at Walt Disney World in Florida, and Main Street was quite a unique department. Whereas we controlled everything that went on after you came into the park and had your ticket stamped. That's tickets. Once you get in. All the way up to and including Cinderella Castle is under Main Street Operations jurisdiction. So we took care of everything. We were coordinators and we had to do everything. And everything was controlled by us, including uh, special events, VIPs, parades, shows, you name it. We also did the Main Street vehicles. We did the Penny Arcade. We did the Walt Disney Story. The Steam Trains was a sister department. But everything was under the umbrella of Main Street. So we were quite independent. We were hand-chosen, special, selective people who were of high intelligence to be able to react to situations on the fly. Right. So it was a high honor to be not only selected to work as a cast member at Walt Disney World in that time period. The, it was very, very high honor. They were very selective. But also to have been placed in Main Street Operations was a big deal. Yeah. So um, I, I am a bit theatrical in my presentations, <laughs> the way I do things, where not everybody has that personality. Right. So everything I did at Disney had a presentation to it, no matter where I went. And you know, if you're working with other people in your department and they don't have that personality flair, they are a little intimidated by you yeah. because you're going to shine and they're going to be in the shadow and it makes them feel a little bit um, overwhelmed. Think, is what it that's is. why some people in the, I'm just going to call it the amusement industry, uh, don't like you because not only are you a, kind of a genius about the industry itself, but you have that kind of uh, Carnival Barker, P.T. Barnum personality? Well, there's an old uh, expression from poor Albert, who was an old, uh, you know, Revolutionary War, uh, you know, type of celebrity. And he had the almanac, poor, poor Albert's almanac. And he says, those who are feared are hated. Yeah. And... Um, mm -hmm. I, I am feared by some because I'm too good at what I do, uh, and and therefore I, I'm perceived as a threat. I'm not, uh, perhaps to their pocketbook I might be, but I'm not in it for money. So there's the paradox. So so how are you not? Because it's your passion. It's your life's work. By the way, do you have any other interests in the world besides what you do in, in the arcade? No, uh, this music? is pretty much my life. You're looking you know, at... When, when you're home, alone, <coughs> uh, like... I, I watch old movies and things okay. of this nature, but yeah. I mean, I was a high life player at one point in my life. Okay. I played the drums and, okay. uh, you know, kid stuff. But, you yeah. know, you have to understand, um, I didn't go through a dating stage. Uh, I didn't have girlfriends. I didn't get That's married. Right. I, was re I, I was didn't reading. have kids. You were bullied. I was bullied. I was picked on. Um, but that made me who I am. Yeah. That made me not reliant upon a social activity. You know, if you stop and think how much time you put into social activities in your lifetime, you would be astonished. And, and what you could, what you weren't able to get done in your well, life and career. <laughs> I, I, I had none of that. And what I did was I worked on games. That was my passion on it. And these, then you these started hoarding them. By the way, I hear you. Well, <laughs> you not only embrace the hoarder uh, moniker, right? Yeah, absolutely. But you also embrace like there were studies done that most hoarders have some kind of mental disorder. And, you're, and, and you said well, something about that, but I... This, this is nonsense. Uh, you know, if somebody is going to go out and collect the, uh, the grocery trash from somebody else's garbage can and drag it into the house, that could be a mental disorder. <laughs> but for people who collect funny, things... I'm sorry. Well, people who collect things to extreme, yeah. that's not hoarding. Yeah. That's a passion. That's a yeah. dedication. Yeah. And there's nothing it's not wrong like with OCD. that. You've never been actually diagnosed with a mental disorder, have you? Actually, I've been diagnosed as being genius, but not... Uh, <laughs> no, seriously, on different... You know, psychological yeah. levels, but I, I'm certainly not, uh, you know, obsessive compulsive or anything like right. that. At one time, I, I had a short lived business partner instead of a landlord who was obsessive compulsive, and it used to be fun because when I'm in a project, I mean, I would have boxes and boxes of parts and things that came in, in packages, and I just opened the package, and the garbage would be all over the floor. And you'd literally walk through the boxes, yeah. and he'd come in, and it, it drove him nuts, and he'd be picking up all the stuff, and I'd say, Leave it alone, I know where that box is, there might be something. 
something in that box, leave it alone. And he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. He'd come in, he'd start picking stuff up. And I used to have fun just throwing stuff on the floor oh, to watch how long, that? just to watch how long it would take for him to have to pick well, that's that up. Kind of mean. Well, no, this is this is. Speaking of from I'm someone a fun who was guy. Bullied. That's not bullying. Oh, I'm sure he found it. Fun. I'm a fun guy. Oh, did he find it? Fun? Absolutely, because fun I was only one to him. Both parties are having fun. Absolutely. By the way, can we take a little walk to get well, away from yes, the Yes, we're going to go this way. Okay. Um, oh, I'm going to go first. Well, you know, let me explain to you a little bit. Oh, I, let me, I didn't finish that topic with Disney and how this connects. Let's get away from okay. the traffic, though. Are we getting traffic sound? Yes. All right, you have to understand something. Um, doing the presentations I used to do, showing other people up who worked in my department, one day I walk into our uh, meeting area and one of the guys in my department was making a joke. And he says, oh, the new guidebooks are coming out next week and there's going to be a new new land and it's going to be Randy Land. <laughs> and I, I, I was like, wow, what a wonderful land that would be. Would you believe them? With an audio animatronic Randy waiting to greet you at every every location <laughs> you know and you know I was having fun with them teasing and back it, and, and the, the faces I saw their faces their faces was not only of shock of thought that yes I could see that happening but also like they want to stick their finger in their mouth and vomit yeah. so I saw the shock appeal of the Randy land idea yeah. and I said to myself this is perfect marketing. I loved it. So it became the beginning of Randy Land. And when I was in Seaside, at one point, I had to build a replacement for myself because I had gotten sick from overdoing what I was doing. And I built an audio animatronic Randy that could run my game. It used my voice and it created its own subroutines through sentence <laughs> fragments. And I'm an electrical engineer. Because you wouldn't let I another do. human do it? Uh, well, of course not. Nobody <laughs> could do it without the flair of Randy. So <clears throat> Randy was the automatic Randy was called Mr. Marvelous, which was another little coined routine I used to do in Disney World because people would you know say that I'm egotistical sometimes when I'm playing up to them. And I'm really a very humble person. But when I would see that they would think I'm being egotistical, I'd say, you know, well, I'm you know, I'm not egotistical. I happen to be Mr. Marvelous, you know, and they look at me like, oh my God, was he just come kind of nut? And I say, well, some people are wonderful, some people are fabulous, some people are the best in the world. I happen to be all of them. It's so hard when you're reaping with personality poison, personal magnetism, mm -hmm. with just that glow of wonderfulness that reaches around my person, you may kiss the fingers. But I mean, this is <laughs> this is an example of personality. This is yeah. not narcissism. This is having fun with people yeah. because that's what you do. Speaking of fun, uh, uh, what's something, because I think it'll be fun for people who know you, is, is there at least one thing? Thing that uh, you could tell people that they do not know about you, that they can't read about you? Gee, um, it could be that, you know, you like the color black. Like, is there, I, I, when well, I see you, you're always all dressed in all black. The, well, I, <laughs> that's a, there's a whole story to that, too. But uh, there's the number 23. Oh, okay. That is a very, very iconic, amazing number. And it goes back to when I first started playing Fascination in Seaside as a kid, before I was ever into business. And the one machine that was the most magical for me that I did, I could do no wrong, I could do all the winning, was number 23. And we had a special bond, me and number 23. And I would, you know, give the machine a kiss when I would come in. And, you know, when it would do a special win for me, I'd give it an affection to tap on the side and, and the machine knew that I loved them and the machine loved me as well it didn't do the same for anybody else only for me right. well um, after I had gotten thrown out of that store for winning too much and I couldn't play my number 23 I started playing in Keensburg Amusement Park they found another fascination and the only table that I could do all the magic on there was 23 right. again the number 23 which has popped up many many 20, times 23 throughout is my a number I don't know if you're into numerology at all but it has it has great cosmic and astrological significance. Can well, we, we I don't know if I believe in that, but it, it, it do indeed does. What do you believe in? Do, well, you believe in? do you believe in I'm, God? I'm a Christian. God? God? I'm a Christian. Okay. I don't believe in the different secular groups of Christianity. I believe that's man-made. A lot of religion gets corrupt, but I believe in Jesus Christ. Therefore, I'm a Christian. I was raised that way. And there's nobody on earth who can tell me that God doesn't exist because I've had encounters with God, and I know my own guardian angel, and I know his name, first and last. So uh, not everybody... What is it? Uh, his name is Michael Naval, and uh, I met him uh, after my mom died with a special encounter where I was taken into a special zone 
in the middle of the night. I was not sleeping, and I was in the presence of, I'm going to say God, although God was not with form, but I was in the presence of spirits for sure, and the only one that did have physical form was Michael Naval when he was called to stand as my guardian angel to replace my protector, who was my mother all the years, and he opened a old wooden box that looked like it was dug up from the earth. It was long and thin, and inside I could see there was a, uh, a dried, rusted flattened piece of metal in the side of uh, looked like an upside down long cross and when he stuck his he stuck his hand inside the box that metal grew and plumped up like a sponge in water and it glowed lava red and became a sword which he took out in his hand as the symbol of my protector as my guardian angel and he was given the choice he had recently died i didn't know if that meant a week or a thousand years but he was given the choice to either go directly to heaven or to remain on earth as my guardian angel and of course he chose the latter so michael naval is with me and wow. you know you don't have a first and a last name for for dreams and, and in vivid color i'm sorry this was very very real wow. and uh i could go into quite detail with that but god is real and for anybody who is doubting in their life trust me when i tell you don't doubt god because you are here for for purpose and everyone has a purpose in life and it, no matter if it's a big purpose or a small purpose it is a purpose and what i do is my purpose i am here not only just to collect machines but to stand as representative as example for other people it's not what we do as much as it is the way we do it and it's very very important because everybody's eyes watch even little kids you might not realize who's watching you. Everybody is watching you. Just like you listeners out there, you're listening to these words and you don't know who you're talking to or how it touches their lives. But it's important that you're saying it because you're speaking the truth and they can understand when you speak the truth. It's too much deception in this world. And when you hear deception, you know it. When you hear gospel truth, you know it too. Yeah. And you're looking in my eyes and you see it yeah. because it is the truth. Yeah, man. Wow. So good, going good back, stuff. God bless you. Thank you, Randy Sinna. So uh, the next part of this is uh, something we do every week. And have you ever heard of the the writer Marcel Proust? No. Okay, I think he's a French uh, writer philosopher. I hate. All, I, I never liked his work, but he has this one famous questionnaire. And celebrities for like, I think the past like 40, 60, 80 years or however long have been answering him. I answered it once. Uh, in Boston on a newspaper but they're deep questions and I had three days to answer and they were like three pages you know each qu each question I answered three pages uh, I like to do this as a kind of ink blot test the first thing that comes to your mind are you ready I'll give it a shot mr. Randy Senna I know oh, Randy land <clears throat> what is your idea of perfect happiness perfect happiness is doing exactly what you dreamed of doing all your life and living your dreams all right what is your most defined? Uh, def usually, it's, it says, "What is your most marked characteristic?" People often say, "What's marked me?" It just means you know the, the characteristic that you think defines you the most. My personality. Okay, Mr. Randy Center, aka Randy Land. What do you consider your greatest achievement? <sighs> Having lived my dreams to the extreme. What is your greatest fear? Of not completing them. What? And uh, how you're like what? How old are you now? I am sixty-one. And you're, you seem to be in very good health. I'm in excellent health. You're probably going to be one of those people who live to eighty, ninety, or hundred. So we don't know that. What have you? What's left unfinished besides opening Randy Land? Well, time is not our friend, and I've been basically stopped in my project here for over twenty years. I may not have another twenty years. I certainly don't have enough. 20 years left in me to do physically what I've done in the first 20 years. Um, I have an enormous preservation collection of amusement park memorabilia and arcade artifacts and most of it sits in storage. Many of those things have sat in storage for over 30 years. They have not seen the light of day. My mission was to preserve a way of life that we all loved. We have a common history with the way we played and you judge a society not by necessarily what we do but the way we play because that tells you who you are. So it's an important project. These, these things are not missed and forgotten and I've done it on small levels and Randy Land here is actually a small level of what I yeah. wanted to do. Originally I saw the ability of the next building across the street 
being available, I wanted to purchase that, connect with a pedestrian bridge across the top. This entire street would have developed into something. It would have been Main Street, just like the Magic Kingdom at Walt Disney World, where I was Main Street Operations. This Woolworths building was the Emporium on Main Street. That's as I saw it when I came here. The same soapstone brick, the same red ribbon sign as the Emporium, the old 5, 5 and 10 iconic. I was put here for a reason. Same thing with the Main Street omnibuses from Walt Disney World, which I drove at Main Street, and I have acquired two of them. And I have them here in Wildwood. And I could see them going up and down Pacific Avenue because Pacific Avenue is Main Street of Wildwood. And it would have developed this entire street into a destination where people would come, a family destination. And that's very important because... Because this, this Main Street, Pacific Avenue, in this part of Wildwood, you can see the way it's the skinniest street, and you see the buildings. They look like old, you know, Woolworths and Diamond Store. Absolutely. Uh, but it's it's not been active for at least the amount of time you've been here. Had they just let you do your thing, it would have been amazing. Well, but, you know, not only that they personally wanted to prevent me, but you know, forty years ago when I was a kid coming to Wildwood. There were so many people who came here that everybody made money. It didn't matter where you were, what location you were. Pacific Avenue, Main Street was jamming with people. And, and it was a club scene at night. It was just Woolworths and, and Murphy's across the street. Newberry's was here. All the stores were here. What's changed is you don't have as much tourism as you did. Really? Absolutely. There's far less tourism who come down to Wildwood. I mean, it used to be you could spend a half an hour, you know, just trying to get four blocks down New Jersey Avenue. There was so much traffic. That doesn't exist anymore. You why used to why be, do you think that is? Well, people, you know, their vacation habits have changed. Family habits have changed. People don't save up all year long for mom and dad to pack up the station wagon and go down to Wildwood for their two weeks or their month of their summer anymore. It's not the case. In most cases, two parents are working today. That wasn't the case when I was a kid. People have central air conditioning. Nobody had air conditioning back when I was a kid. I was born in 1960. So wait, did you factor in those changes? Because if, if you continue to, to try to do what you wanted to, would there be an audience for it? Well, there will always be an audience because there's enough decent people out there who will come and see what you want to do. But since I'm not in it based upon high profits, the audience doesn't have to be a massive. Uh, what I do is also a mission. So it, it's more about doing it than it is the profit involved. Yes, you got to pay your bills. It's a real world. So there's expenses. And the more money I have, the more things I can do, the more preservation items I can preserve, purchase, and find a, a home for. Mm -hmm. But as it stands right now, I have not only this building filled with all kinds I, of equipment and artifacts, know, can, can I have a store on the boardwalk, I have other buildings filled with stuff, and I have 40, 40 tractor trailers filled with equipment and preservation things that are, are in truck yards in New Jersey and have been for years, for decades. And and some of that stuff is, is getting ruined. That must be so frustrating for someone like you well, to have all this stuff because you're not hoarding it just for you. You want people to enjoy it. And what is it? It's, it's finding the right place or places where you can. Well, as the saying it. was earlier, it's to preserve a way of life yeah. that one well, knew and loved. I guess they're being preserved I in the loved, trailers. I, well, yes, better than being in a landfill someplace. But if they don't get out to see the light of day, yeah. who knows where it's going to end up? It'll exactly. be either in garages of collectors scattered across the country. It'll be gutted for parts, and, and the rest of it will be in the landfill. Other stuff will just be unrecognized. They won't recognize where it came from. Right. They will not know the value, and they will throw it away, and nobody will realize the attachments that other people had. You know, I've had people walk into my retro arcades on the boardwalk, and several times an instance occurred where somebody would walk in, and they'd stop, and I'd see them in tears. Aww. And I would come over to see if they're okay. What happened? Did they get hurt did somebody do something to them and they would be choked up and they'd be like well just a minute and they would they would you know get consoled and they would say you don't understand you know i remember that machine oh. i used to play that machine when i was a kid and so and so and all the flood of memories comes to them through the association of that machine where the machine was the people they used to know the area they used to know their parents who may be gone their their friends that are gone they're all important memory triggers so it's important to hold on to your things yeah, speak, pictures are great of, speaking of history which historical figure do you most identify with 
Um, well, there's several, but I would say I'm a close analogy to Walt Disney. Right on. And which living person do you most admire? Oh, my. I don't know. That's a very, very tough question. Um, I would have to give that a lot of deep thought. There's none that comes directly to mind as far <laughs> as, you know, somebody who I admire. There were people who I, I did admire who, unfortunately, over, you know, decades have proved themselves to be unworthy of that admiration. All right. So there's no living person right now that you admire? God. Okay. Well, okay. Fine. Living God. Okay. Living human person who's not God. Oh, I don't know. I can't call myself, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What is the trait you most hate about yourself? Oh, well, I would say that I'm very gullible in the respect that I believe what people tell me verbatim. And although I'm aware of deceptions and many people are not straightforward, I always believe everything they say, and that's to my detriment many times. Right. Okay. So what is the trait you most uh, dislike in other people? Probably their lack of decency. Right. Common decency. And what, what, which word or phrases do you most overuse? At the sound of the bell. <laughs> At the sound of the bell. At the sound of the bell, I'm, we'll try I'm, a new I'm game. Here we go. And everything uh, is related to the sound of the bell. Uh, what... Randy Senna, a.k.a. Mr. Randy Land, what is your greatest regret? I would say my greatest regret was having left Walt Disney World wow. in Florida. Really? Yeah, I mean, Even after all you've done since then? Well, I, I loved working there. It was another dream, and they loved me. Um, I have to say that if I had remained... I probably would have been extremely high echelon yeah. there. Main Street Operations was a department for that kind of advancement. There was a, a young man who worked in my department. He worked with me many times. He was there a few years higher than I. And today, he is the president of operations. Oh my God, at, you should get in touch at, with him because if he knows everything you have, maybe Walt Disney World will open up a little section just well, with all your stuff. Well, I had always kind of hoped that Disney would, you know, realize that I am a ready-made commodity I know, but you have them. to, someone has to pitch them. They, they're not just going to come to you. They're, they're not busy. easily pitchable. You can contact them all you want and they'll send you back the form saying they don't well, maybe you know, I accept can help unsolicited, out. I, I, you know, ideas from anybody. There are enough hierarchy there that are a aware of me yeah. but you know in the corporate world it's the old story of that play how do you succeed in business without really trying in the corporate world many people are afraid to come up with ideas or rock the boat because if something doesn't go right they are the full guy and they get fired so everybody kind of sits there quietly and they don't think outside of the box i'm very very much the opposite i'm very very outside of the box and i bring ideas for the right reasons i live those ideas and i make them realities that's not corporate corporate disney today is not the same as walt disney productions was during the time period that i fell in love with it in the time that i worked there mm -hmm. i was working there during those people the transition that everything when you were younger is better than it is today well I would say in large part, yes, because of people. Uh, people appreciated things more. They God's were in satisfied. Though, right? I'm sorry? I said God is in everyone, though, no? God is in everyone, and God gives you a free will, and God allows you to make your decisions, but ultimately the world will end for a reason, because man will be corrupted by the devil, who is the prince of this earth. Right. Right now, I don't know why they put this question after that last one, because I feel like we're on a... A downslope. Right now, in this moment, what is your current state of mind? Clear. Total clarity. Okay. If you could change one thing about your family, what would it be? My parents would be back with me rather than being, you know, beyond. Gotcha. You know, I named a church after my mother who passed. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this question is going to be... Uh, you might explode from this question. What is your most treasured possession? For someone who has so many possessions, what is your most treasured possession? Table 23 from Seaside. When the machine I played out as a kid was thrown out of the store, I later came back and purchased. Gotcha. What do you regard as the lowest depth of misery? The lowest depth of misery? Oh, there's so much of it. 
but um, I would say the constant persecution of people who just bully you to the point that you become withdrawn from the world. Okay. All right. That, that makes sense. You live here on the Jersey Cape? I do. Uh, technically, I'm a Florida resident. My home is still in Orlando from when I used to work at Walt Disney World. I was going to say, if, if you weren't living here, where would you like to live? Is I it, would there? probably be back over at Disney and yeah. probably yeah. trying to change things from what they have become because I'm old school and I carry the original Magic and Pixie Dust, which unfortunately has <laughs> been changed over the years uh, out of necessity in large part out of um, need for corporate growth and pleasing stockholders and others but I'm the purist and I believe in the original magic and the original dreams you know remember Walt Disney lived his dreams that's what the park was about that's why it's called Walt Disney World it's not Disney World it's Walt Disney World we were particularly trained in order to define it that way so when i would be in an attraction i wouldn't say you know welcome aboard the disney world railroad system It'd be welcome aboard the walt disney world steam railroad system because it was about a man's dream and isn't that the parallel that here i am living my dream yeah all right what out of all the occupations in the world ones you've uh, you know positions you've been in but could be anything what is your favorite occupation Amusement game operator. Okay. What is the quality you most... I should have guessed that one. Huh? What is the quality you most like in a man? Honesty. What decency. The, what is the quality you most like in a woman? Would be the same. What are your Randy Senna's favorite names? Randy. <laughs> Mom. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Marvelous. Uh, 23. Miss, this is a name, too, you know. Mr. But, Fascination that's himself. Great. And finally, this is the, the last Marcel Proust question. What, Randy Senna, is your motto? My motto? Well, you know, this is an unusual thing. Um, never give up. All right. You know, for someone who has so many... You know, uh, you're, you're such a quotable person. And mm -hmm. a lot of them are filled with, you know, wisdom and knowledge. Uh, it's, it's, it's not surprising that you'd be like, you know what? Never give up. One of the most simple. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you can't give up. If you give up, then you weren't loyal to your dreams. Yeah. And I know you're on Facebook. Cause I want to give out, I want to promote you now. Do it. Give out your URLs. You don't have a website? Not a actual web website. No. I, I do a lot with Facebook. And I, I really... <laughs> I really didn't like Facebook. I didn't even want to start it. I got into it basically because uh, uh, the business and people wanted a way to communicate with me. And I figured, yeah. well, you know what? Here's a way to find old yeah. friends. And now you're Mr. Facebook. You're, well, you're uploading content all the time. I am. So it's Randy, R-A-N-D-Y-S. And his last name is Senna, S-E-N-N-A -N -N -A on Facebook. You're easy to find. But lots of content. Are, do you, are you on any other social media platforms? Well, I'm or? on YouTube. That's, uh, uh, you know, M Main Street Randyland is my uh, okay. name there, obviously. You know, who that could be. Uh, I, I do have a, an account on Twitter, but I, I never use it. And as a matter of fact, uh, the only reason I have it was because somebody made a false account on me for, for Twitter and was doing it for a couple of years using pictures that they got from my Facebook. Oh, wow. This is what happens when you get celebrities. They, they steal your pictures mm -hmm. and they open the accounts that are bogus. And uh, one guy was uh, trying to sell equipment pretending he was me. And I don't know if he took deposits from people and never gave them equipment oh, or God. he was selling equipment he had. I never heard anything further. But, I mean, this was ridiculous. Then I had to fight with Twitter just to get it removed. It was unbelievable. I had to send them all. I had to actually start uh, a, a case with the federal government for identity theft before Twitter would remove the account. Wow. Crazy, crazy, crazy. But you talk about celebrity stuff. I've had stalkers. You know, just from doing TV shows. I mean, crazy, crazy stuff. Uh, uh, has anyone ever tried to uh, break in where we are now? Um, I, not to my knowledge. I mean, we have alarm systems, obviously, but uh, I, don't, I don't think anybody's physically tried to break in here. They wouldn't get very far if they did. We're in the middle of Main Street. Yeah. But I, I've, I've had break-ins in my no, life. not even any aisles, right? Sure there are, but the aisles, unfortunately, right now, they have been commandeered by things because of moving <laughs> stuff around. But, you know, to take the tour here, you first have to understand that what this is, this is more so than an amusement museum. This theme here is the connection that ties everything together is I. 
it is my life in the amusements. So that's why it's called Randy Land, because all the connections here, everything here has a history with me. Yeah. I played that machine. I was there. I yeah. acquired it. I dragged it across the boardwalk to the waiting station wagon, down to take it down to the house and across the grass and fixed it up and all these things. Every single thing was here. Even when you get to the point where you see you know, a little boardwalk area, every board was carried by my hands. Every nail was placed by my hands. This is the total dedication and also how you can do stuff without big funding because I don't get paid mm. if I had to hire people how, to How do stuff. you fund all this? By working like a dog, honestly. Do, do you uh, have another gig that funds I don't have passion? another I don't have another gig. This is so my total buying? life and, and it's very difficult because as time goes on and inflation makes the dollar worth less and less, you have to remember I'm still in a business that's coin operated. Right. I'm in a coin operated business in a big dollar world. Back in the day when pinball machines were a quarter yeah. in the 80s, the Parkway toll was a quarter. Right. Can't, can't they just uh, update them and like uh, smack your phone against it or use a card? <clears throat> well, you can, but it takes away the experience. I mean, a lot of the arcades today have gone to swipe cards. I will never do that because part yeah. of but the But those kids who are doing it now with the swipe cards, when they're your age, they're going to be like crying because someone like gives them a card. Oh, you have to use a card for this machine. Well, people are creatures of habit. They know what it is, but you can swipe a card in any arcade. You can go to the grocery store and swipe your card. You know what I'm saying when cards are no longer in use, 40 years from now, 60 years from now, there will be someone crying, and the proprietor, the new you, will come over to them like, I'm glad I gave you that experience. Well, I would think, but you know, I don't think there's going to be arcades as we know them in 60 years. I don't think there's going to be a world in 60 years. Gotcha. All right. So we don't have to worry about that. But it's, it's part of the experience. What do you think is going to uh, stop the world? Is it going to be the climate change or the uh, pandemic? Man. Man will destroy the world just as he yeah. has done with right. the pandemic. It's a perfect example. Except the billionaires get to go to Mars. Well, nobody's going to escape and nobody has been off the planet. Nobody has gone to the moon. Don't even get me started on that. <laughs> um, the, the factors are that we are here. We're all in it together. So people need to live together and get along together. But they will never do so because everybody wants to step on everybody else to climb up the evolutionary scale and, and gain. Yeah. And it's all about yeah. money. Yeah. It's not about money here. Money's the but most I, I, least I'm important. Still, I'm trying to figure out, like, you have so much stuff. I mean, a Woolworths that is just packed with the coolest, like, old amusement arcade memorabilia. And then you have 40 trailers, you know, other storage spaces. Uh, but, like... You're what, talking did, mega wealth. Yeah, I know. If but, I but, but sold Were you everything. mega wealthy? No. To, so no, how did you... I was in the place to acquire them when nobody else cared. I would get machines. Okay, so I, I, all your stuff is from, you know, you got it when it was a good price Pretty point. much, pretty much. Okay. The vast, vast majority so nowadays, of nowadays, when was, you see something for sale that from that Usually, era, I would not be able to afford it. Okay, gotcha. Uh, but, you know, when I was a kid and I started working in arcades as a mechanic, uh, I would eventually see a machine in the back corner. They would be telling me to strip out for parts to use in other machines because at that point, the parts were worth more than the machine was worth. And I remember playing that machine and it was an old friend. How could you ask me to rip it? its heart out and its kidneys. So I would make an argument for me to repair the machine and put it back on the floor and the owners usually didn't want to know about it because it didn't make as much money at that point. Right. People were into a little bit more right. modern machine at that point. <laughs> so somebody got the idea one time and said, tell you what, you like the machine so much, instead of getting paid this week, take it home with you. And I said, okay. And next and thing you know, that was the start of it. Huh? Was the start of it. Next thing you know, I'm working for old machines mm. and not getting paid. It didn't matter. I lived at home. I my, I lived, you know, no rent you free. Still, you still, or you did that throughout those years? I still had, work for someone, do something for them, and like, I'll, I'll take that machine instead of Well, it. I've had people do that, but it's not yeah. like it was back in the day. Back yeah, in the yeah. day, they were just clearing out to yeah. them. It was junk. Today, today people realize better the value of things, yeah. whereas back then they didn't. Yeah. And nobody. Because I'm looking around, and this is like a, an eBay dream if, if i would say i'm done i give up on my dream sell it all off cash it all in we're talking millions of dollars yeah, yeah. and i would go sit where on a beach somewhere and get old and die but i sacrifice and i work in the cold or i sleep on a cold floor in order to do whatever's necessary because i'm continuing the passion and the dream yeah. so it's not about money that when you talk about big fears my big fear is what will happen when i'm gone will it be something that will be sold off at an estate sale, spread out across the country, and never see the light of day. Chances are heading that way. Oh, 
because nobody really helps. All they do is hinder, if anything. So it's, it's something I think about all the time, and I know my time is growing short. I don't have that many years ahead by any means that I had prior behind. But nobody can take away that I've been doing what I do for over 40 years and made a success of it that I'm still doing it. Yeah. Nobody else can say that. And on that note, you... Mr. Randy Senna, a.k.a. Randyland, are truly one of a kind. God bless you. Thank you for being on the Will Keenan Family Transmission on WCFA 101.5 FM. Cape May Radio. Wow. Wow. Did you kill an hour already? I didn't even give you the tour. 56 <laughs> minutes. I guess you start your next your next show now. You there, might, there might have to be a part two. There will be. So now we'll take you on the tour. Start yourself again. You got more memory? All right. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> wow. Like, oh.